And we're live. Phil Tarrant, Tom Panos, Real Estate Exposed. And what a privilege it is for me twice in one week to chat to the great Tom Panos, Australia's most famous auctioneer, auctioneer to the stars, gets a result that no one else gets. Are your bookings going through the roof, mate? You're going to have a Saturday off for the next uh, 52 weeks or your most in-demand guy in Australia? Yeah. What date? What time? Yep. $5,000 plus. Plus GST. Yeah, plus GST. Yeah, <laughs> let's be very clear. Plus GST. Thanks a lot. Thank you. In the system. That has an affect feel. That- jokes aside, jokes aside, it must be pretty good for a bloke who um, whose job it is is to help Australia's real estate agents and auctioneers and property managers and mortgage brokers to do better what they do, mate. I've seen a lot of sales coaches come in and out through the companies I've worked in and they talk a good game, but they weren't too good on the tools. At least you've still got the gift on the tools. You can still get the job done and teach other people to do it, mate. That's a valuable commodity and unique. I don't want to talk you up too much, but you've done something no. right. No, I've just finished a training session with Century Century 21 Noosa, who is the number one Century 21 office in Australia. And um, I was sitting there and I was saying, you know, this is the conversation you've got to have with vendors. This is the conversation you've got to have with buyers. He said, oh... But, but, Tom, buyers are saying that the market's going to drop. And I said, well, listen, change the topic. Mr. Buyer, I'm letting you know prices may be dropping, but your borrowing capacity is dropping faster than prices are dropping. Your biggest problem is there's a race against time to use this money before the bank re-rates you and gives you less. Um, and if you're buying a home for your family, don't make a decision based on the market. Base it on your life. And they're sitting there and they're writing and they're saying, you know, how do you come up with these things? I said, it's really simple. I think it through and then I test it. I test it. You've got a test feel, right? Because everything looks great on a textbook, right? You test it there and you see the engagement and the response you're getting from, um, from buyers. And, um, you know, another example, Phil, every listing I walk into that I'm auctioning, I say to the owners, can I ask you, what's your understanding of the current market? They all say it's not good. I then say, do you think it'll go up or down in the near future? They all say down. And then I say, we're on the same page. Let's sell it. Most real estate agents don't ask the questions. They go in, oh, the market's not good. And the vendors are thinking, yeah, I know. You're one of these sledgehammer commission-based agents. So great agents, Phil, if you think about it, they actually don't make statements. They ask questions that lead people to where they want them to go. So, uh, yes, I'm posing off. Yes, I'm posing off. Hey, Tanya, good to see you. Um, and this man here, he's your number three man in REB, I think, uh, Matt, Matt, Matt Pilios, uh, the greatest auctioneer in the block history, 1.58 million. Yeah. But, Phil, getting back to your question, it, it makes a lot of sense to be doing the stuff you're teaching because no training course survives collision with reality. And I don't know why someone in the world of mortgage broking has not emulated what I'm doing. I mean, I know that there's a lot of good mortgage brokers that do the occasional training conference. But, you know, the other day, Phil, I was speaking at a, at a conference on the Gold Coast. It was the Aussie, Aussie um, Lendy event. And I looked at the program, you know, you had, had great speakers, celebrity type speakers, you know, the, you know, surfers or people that have got one leg, you know, they're great achievements, you know, for people. But there wasn't anyone saying, hey, here is your detailed plan for the next seven days on what you've got to be doing at the moment in this marketplace, you know. Um, yeah. I think there's an yeah. opportunity. Yeah, there. it's funny you say that. And I've thought long and hard about it. And there's some good operators, Tom, um, uh, in the mortgage broker training space. And, and two of them that, that spring to mind is um, uh, Jason Back and uh, Ross uh, Lacane, who's uh, he's an ex-Aussie uh, broker. And, and and Jason used to work out of um, uh, XANZ Bank, uh, Australian Lending Investment Centres. You, you, know you know the biggest difference? They're, they're good. And if you're a mortgage broker and you're looking for some assistance, and, you know, I know these guys and just, just I don't want to plug them too hard, but... You know they're 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 good operators. The biggest difference, though, Tom, and maybe one one for discussion. I know we're going to talk about mass sackings, and we'll get into that in a moment. A uh, bit of a sensational clickbait head, headline there, Tom, but I'll I'll forgive you on that. Um, 
real estate agents identify themselves as salespeople. Mortgage brokers don't identify themselves as salespeople. And that's the fundamental difference. That is profound. That is absolutely profound. And you've just made me realise something that the broker of the year that you awarded four years ago that I was with you at Sydney, Bernard Desmond, Bernard Desmond says, yeah. Bernard Desmond, he says, as mortgage brokers, we need to prospect loans, not process loans. And what you've basically gone off and said is that there's obviously some beliefs and narratives of that mortgage broke industry that we're not hustlers. We're not, you know, out there chasers, right? Which I think from a consumer's point of view, sure, position yourself as a trusted advisor, be a problem solver. But if you're not waking up fuel each morning and understanding your job is to meet potential people that you can do business with and tell them who you are, tell them what you're all about. I think um, that's why I think, you know, the average mortgage broker, I was so surprised, Phil. You know, they do 20 to 30 mil a year. There's others that are doing less, you know. Mm. And, and there are others, others doing a lot. There's, there's others that do a lot more, Tom. And and most, and, and a real estate agent, the, the structure of real estate agents is different sort of largely than mortgage brokers. There's, most mortgage brokers are still sort of sole operators. They, they, they do everything. They, they, um, they eat what they kill, essentially. Uh, you have some larger groups which are um, sort of structured a little bit more and they'll have different people doing different parts of the mortgage broker process. And it's there you'll probably find people whose job is business development and sales. Their job is to find people to do... Tom, I'm gonna. You can use this, mate. Every job has two jobs. Every job has well two done. jobs. There's a job mate, of finding people to do mortgages have... for, and yeah. there's a job of doing the mortgage. You're so smart, Phil. That was my opening sentence at the conference for the mortgage brokers. Oh, was it? You know, <laughs> it, was. it was. Yeah, I remember you, you told me that about a couple of years ago. You'd be you'd be surprised how often I use that, right? Um, and and anyone in business, um. Uh, and professional services or, or financial service in particular, every job has two jobs. You've got to be a really, really good practitioner at what you do, and you've got to be really, really good at finding people to do it for. Um, I was surprised. We, we took a whole bunch of mortgage brokers out to San Francisco. Uh, it, it'd be sort of three, four years ago now, and, and we had uh, a Salesforce, some, some head um, evangelist or head futurists of Salesforce come in and we expected them to say, yeah, um, uh, you're going to get replaced by robots. They're going to do your mortgages. And he said completely opposite thing. He said um, uh, the amount of time that mortgage brokers or, or people who deliver financial services advice will spend on education will increase, you know, fourfold. I can't remember exactly the number over the coming years. So that is they'll get better at doing their job. Uh, of being a financial services advice professional, um, but it still needs to go. Obviously, Salesforce is still going to go hand in hand with finding people to do that for. And this is where most people get it wrong, Tom. Um, but back to the point, um, I don't think a lot of sales, a, a lot of mortgage brokers see themselves as doing the first job. I think most mortgage brokers see themselves as doing the second job better. And a lot of that is a product of where they come from. A lot of ex bank managers or people out of banking become mortgage brokers. So they might be good professional, tactical, operational people, but they're not too good at finding people to do it for. So that's where it needs to change. And that's where the, the, the mantra and the metric. And I think, you know, for you, Tom, you've been very active over many years working within our mortgage broker operations here. You've emceed the Better Business Summit for many years. You've been a great speaker because you have that, you're able to, to, to bring in some of that skill set um, and, uh, you yeah, know, the scripts, dialogues and, and, and the robustness of, of sales from real estate to coach mortgage brokers. And I think there's a lot, there's a lot long way to go there, mate. Yeah. And I remember we jointly put together um, a program on mortgage broking, uh, Phil, um, um, at your office. It was a two day plan. And we actually yeah. went in for details with scripts and dialogues. And we talked about the structures and what is the ideal day looking like and what are the objections that come up. And I clearly remember at the time, that for many of them, it was like an awakening 
because they were just so obsessed in talking product, right? So obsessed in, you know, and I'm not saying the product's not important. Of course, you've got to understand the benefits and strengths and weaknesses and the pluses and minuses of the various products you represent uh, for banks and which one suits a client. But, hey, there is no point being best in the world in product knowledge if you've got no one to talk to about it. No, yeah, and, so if you um, sort of, if, 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 how do you change your mindset straight away, Tom, for all those mortgage brokers tuning into this? How, how do you think more like uh, Bernard Desmond um, to actually go out there and be a good professional, you know, advice provider? Um, but how do you get sales as part of your your DNA? How do you live and breathe sales? How do you how do, how do you always focus on the next deal? Because what happens, Tom, and you give some sense to this, is that. Um, uh, if if a mortgage broker has a bit of a purple patch, they're so busy processing loans that they forget to go out there and prospect the next client. So they find themselves in three three months' time with no business. Okay. So probably if you picture this, account management, business development. So what you do is you start understanding, I have a split day. Half the day is account management where I'm looking after existing clients, cert issues. And then the other half of the day is business development, which is the pipeline. So I don't think we're going to create a sales transformation for mortgage brokers on real estate exposed today. But what I will say is if you're a mortgage broker and understand this very simple principle, a pipeline and what are my next 10 deals? I, so, so, Phil, in my business, I don't call it a chase list. I call it a must-win list. A must-win list is the next 10 opportunities that I know are out there that I must win because they're making a decision soon. Real estate agents call it a listings chase list. These are properties that are going to come onto the market and I think mortgage brokers need to have a list of people that are currently about to make a decision to buy and what they've got to be doing is have this must-win list. And what happens is you end up spending your time and energy helping that person because you know that very soon there's a buying opportunity from that person to actually do business with you. Um, that would be it. But, Phil, listen, I think you've got a mortgage broking academy there um, and I'd be very surprised knowing your organisation if there's not a sales focus on that. Yeah, well, we do like champion. We actually have the New Broker Academy coming up, so um, uh, more info on that, you can go to uh, theadvisor.com.au and you find all about that. And, that. and that largely, Tom, is for, for people thinking about becoming a mortgage broker or they're new to mortgage broking. And, you know, yes, you've got to, you've got to um, close those capability gaps as a, a professional to, to provide the best advice and the best solutions to clients, but you got to work out how to sell as well. But, Tom, it's been a mad sort of three, four days for you. Uh, we spoke first thing on Monday morning. Uh, we went behind the real story of the block. I think the first conversation you've had um, uh, post the auction on uh, Sunday night, very popular live stream that we did. It's had, you know, 40-odd thousand people have tuned in and it just keeps growing. So people want to know. You, you've been um, all over the media the last few days, mate. Has it been a big, big few days? There's a couple of observations I'd make, and I'd like, I'd like your view on it. Um, uh, REB uh, did, a, did a piece on this, and, and it's this perception that um, there is no way that Tom Panos and uh, the, 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 the property that you sold could go $1.5 million more than the four other properties. So there's this big question mark about it all going, there's something fishy going on here. And then you start peeling back the layers. And REB did a good piece on this, Tom. Um, the, the, the the point is, is that you guys played it much better than, than everyone else professionally. And that is, you just didn't assume that it was going to go for a whole bunch of money 
because it's a block auction. You went out there and you run a really, really good campaign. You engage people, pre-auction campaigns. There was a party, I believe, beforehand where you brought everyone in so you could sell them the property. You did one-on-ones with potential bidders to try and get a sense for where they were. A lot of people are saying, well, that's not what you should be doing as an auctioneer. That's not part of the sales campaign. That's an unfair advantage. That's not how an auction should be. Um, I think a lot of people are waking up now to how auctions should be run uh, as part of a sales campaign campaign and if you are a vendor and your agent suggests an auction is the right strategy to take at the market rather than going to private treaty how do you do it most effectively to get the outcome you want and as a vendor it's the highest price there is so people think that's unfair that you've played it that way tom do you agree yeah um so so some people absolutely some people think it's unfair so everyone like the daily mail and other people out there were really hoping that they could come up with some sort of evidence or proof that this is a dummy bidder, right? We're hoping for it. But the way it works, Phil, is very simple. Dummy bidders don't bid to buy properties when dummy bidding existed many, many years ago. It's an illegal act, right? Dummy bidders do not bid to buy a property. They bid to not buy it. So they never ever would bid over the reserve, right? If you actually picture it, this guy actually didn't even bid when it was under the reserve. He's come in to blow everyone away. And that, unfortunately, has upset the people that are thinking there's got to be something to it. What we talked about on that video on Monday is actually out of every bit of content that's out there that I've I've, I've read, um, and a lot of people have actually commented on, on that video, what we said that morning is the the truth. That's if anyone wants to know exactly what happened, like that's all they've got to read. It was it was a, a combination of proactive vendors that reached out to high profile people with money, and they did that to a number of people, including including which hasn't been spoken about one of the underbidders that was underneath that was being represented that was being represented by uh, a, a buyer's advocate in addition to that it was the combination of getting strong vendor meetings pro i mean we had a reserve of four million and eighty we weren't having a lot of buyers there so phil in real estate auctions in real estate auctions where i work every day in this market where they're not lining 10 deep to register and you've got one or two, you've got one strategy. The first bid to go hard and way over the reserve, right? Because if that doesn't happen, man, you get anchored down at a low number, it's really hard to go up. And then the third thing is luck. Two people with ego want to be on TV. The changing of the guard. One sits there that is the king of the block, Danny. The other one wants to become the king of the block, Adrian. And a frenzy takes place, right? Simple as that, you know. And um, do I personally, we spoke about it at Mastery with John McGrath on Tuesday. Is the role of an auctioneer now a bingo caller? Does the auctioneer show up, collect a fee of 800 bucks to 900 bucks to actually say, 700 over there with a man with a red tie, 750 over there. Where's the value proposition in that? Or is the value proposition in that to be assisting an agent to create compression selling to then move on, for, and for me, I actually put it up on video. It's, it's on Facebook. You may have seen it, Phil. I got interviewed by Channel 9 five minutes before I had my pre-auction buyer meetings. And the head producer says, can I ask you, what will you be talking about them? And I just said, I'm going to talk to them about bidding hard and fast. I'm going to talk to them about the fact that there is no other property in the years to come that they could say, hey, I bought house number five, I'm the buyer, right? I bought the house block five, right? I'm going to talk to them about the importance to intimidate your competitors so you don't get them competing too hard with you. 
And I think I think real estate agents should actually rely on their auctioneers a lot more. So, Phil, do you you might not know this, but every Friday afternoon, I'm having vendor meetings on Zoom or on the phone with my vendors for the auction. I don't just I don't just show up on, on when I show up on Saturday. Hey, it was great chatting with you yesterday, right? Mm. I'm not. I'm not a stranger there that day. You know what I mean. So, so are, um, you, are you re, are you really finding the role of the auctioneer, or is this the way it's always been? It's just been lost because of market conditions have been forgiving for bad auctioneering. Good question. I'm trying to remember. No, I don't think I'm redefining it. I think that when I was in real estate in the uh, late '80s and early '90s, I used to have I used to have the auctioneers. I've got to say to you, they would call around to the office and they'd say, "Tom, let's go and have a run and have a look at the property." You'd go and look at the property before the day. Oh, Tom, can I introduce you? Yeah, here's the here's the vendor. Wonderful, you've done a, a wonderful property, and there'd be a conversation. Yeah, so Phil. That did appear to happen in the 80s and 90s. So somewhere along the line, the model, I think, has happened. You book an auctioneer, they put it on their timetable, the auctioneer shows up, hopefully on time, hopefully on time, Phil, because Saturdays can get uh, get busy, and um, they do the auction and um, and they leave. I never, Phil, I, 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 I'm prepared to run late to my next auction because I think it's more valuable for me to create the deal there and then than leave and say, oh, sorry, I've got to go, right? Because mm -hmm. the next vendor knows I'll be doing the same for them. I just think the value of closing a deal is far more important than running a few minutes late. And I don't want to but, create the impression. Yeah, but like tell, tell me about, though, pre-auction pre meetings with bidders. Um, how how when does that happen? Like, you know, the, the, the blocks are condensed environment when you get there and you can speak to beforehand. And how do you do that in the real world any given Saturday? How do you get a sense for how bidders will bid by having a conversation with them beforehand and in many ways influencing the way they will bid by having that dialogue and that connectivity before you start the auction? Jeez, you ask great questions. You pull out the best content and um, we give it away nice and free. Uh, to the to the viewers. So Phil, I'll role play this. Can I role play this with you? Sure. Right. So you're you're a buyer. It's a pre auction buyer meeting. Um, most likely being done by Zoom. Most likely being done by Zoom. Um, like to look at people's eyes. Um, um, should be done by the agent. Should be done by the agent. Right. Let's take away. Let's take away um, the TV um, scenario. Um, I did my pre-auction uh, buy meeting. I did it, and I got approval off the agent to do it on the Saturday. I didn't sit down and have a Zoom with them beforehand. So I'll just replay what a good uh, pre-auction uh, buy meeting is. Hi, Phil. How are you going? Uh, good, Tom. You well? Yeah, good. Look, this is going to be very nice and short and sharp. All I wanted to do is just um, wish you all the best for uh, Saturday. Right, I know it can get very, very stressful. And what I thought I'd do is just spend a few minutes with you right now because on Saturday, I might be a little bit caught up with what's going on. I'll be running around, you know, doing the various things, you know, putting the auction up. Um, and I just want to let you know, firstly, it's very important that you're aware if you are successful, the laws of auction say you have to sign a contract and pay a 10% deposit. Um, out of role play, Phil, I make a point of it. And the reason why is I don't want people, Phil, to come along, buy a property, and then not want to sign a contract, right? Number two, and particularly with many areas that have got people that are bidding that have come from other cultures where auction is not a, a, a method of sale, right? Number two, Phil, I want to let you know that I've been auctioning for around 25 years, and I've noticed a pattern, and that is that often the first bidder wins the property, the person that bids first. I also have noticed that the person that bids hard and fast and aggressively actually seems to intimidate other bidders. I'm not dictating on whether you should do that, but I think um, it would be useful for you to know what my 25 years of experience suggests improves, improves the probability of you winning a property. Phil, there's a thing called a hammer blow, and that is it's such a strong bid it scares everyone away 
So no one ever really gets into momentum to bid against you. And then often you're the only one and the only person you're bidding against is the vendor versus other bidders. If I was bidding on a home this weekend, my strategy would be to bid fast, to bid loud and make it a strong bid and scare everyone away. The third thing, Phil, I want to discuss with you is that um, every week there are sales that happen in the marketplace and those sales become the reference points um, on values. What I'd like to do is to share on the screen the last three transactions that have happened in the last seven days that we believe are the most comparable. So then, Phil, what I would do is I would share the screen, bring them up, and then after showing them, I'd take off, go back into normal view, and I'd say, how do you feel about those transactions? And what that's doing, Phil, is helping me understand their instant reaction. Are they thinking to themselves, man, we're out of the league here, or we know that that's where we've got to be? I don't find, Phil, that people will actually give you too much information apart from the ones that are saying, well, if it's going to go for that, we're not even coming. And, and that's a good thing, right? You're getting rid of dead wood um, uh, out of the auction and then also um, people don't get upset and annoyed and all those sort of things, you know. It's, um, yeah, that's, Phil, that's you know the, awesome. Phil, you know the thing, Phil, I'll tell you the thing that's pissed me off about auctions over the years, right? What happens is agents go out and they promote a property. They give hope to people to come along to the auction. The people get a pest inspection. They get a building inspection. They get their solicitor to change stuffs on the contracts. They get emotionally involved. They have the brochure sitting on their kitchen table every morning while they're having breakfast and they fall in love with the property. And then they come along to bid on the property and they've got this strategy. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, I'm going to open it up at seven hundred thousand dollars, I'm going to open it up at seven hundred thousand, and um, I'm going to go to um, about eight fifty. Um, that's my last price. They go there, ladies and gentlemen. It's over to you. Opening bidder offer, bang, nine fifty, and they're just sitting there. Someone else has made a bid of nine fifty, and they're thinking to themselves, "What the heck? Mm. Like, what the heck?" It saddens me because you know how many people I see and I would be surprised if not one of the biggest complaints that Office of Fair Trading gets are those of underquoting, right? Yeah. Um, all I'm saying, Phil, is it just makes a lot of damn sense to have a meeting with them on the Wednesday or Thursday prior to auction and to say, hey, I want to let you know this is where it's looking at because it gives them an opportunity to go on a real estate com and domain themselves in the next two days and say, you know what, maybe that's where we've got to be, right? And it saves a lot of time where an agent but, goes up to buyers whispering in the ear, pay more, pay more, you should be paying yeah. more. Have these conversations. But, but you, you think, Tom, of the second and, second and third order positive impacts of that. If if you're able to um, manage those expectations at that meeting and they go, no, nah, that's too rich for our blood, the real estate agent can go, well, where, where are you at? Hey, let's go and find you something at the right price point. We have this, this, this. This may be suitable for you. So number one, they're not disappointed and annoyed. Uh, and number two, you're providing um, a, a, a po positive impact for them by getting them into the property they want to be in. That's smart business, Tom. And this is it. And, and going back to the point, a lot of people think it's unfair to do um, pre bidder meetings. I think that's smart business. And I think every single agent across the land will be expecting more from them, their, their, themselves and their teams when it comes up to auction day, rather than just trying to do it on the slide, on the side, whispering in someone's ear, and they're going to be looking towards their auctioneer differently for what they want from that. I, I think you've set the new benchmark, Tom. I think that three seconds of TV was a masterclass in auctioneering when you had that first bid come in and you went, nah, that's not going to fly. The next bid was 4.5. 
five hundred thousand dollars nearly over the reserve straight off the back, and that was that was the alleged dummy bidder who was happy to pay five hundred straight off the bat uh, over the reserve. So I, I think we've put uh, an end to that uh, commentary and discussions, Tom. Now you had a uh, um, uh, uh, some text there about mass sackings, um, and I want to have a discussion with you around this. Uh, we, we all will probably need to be living under a rock, but uh, Elon Musk. Uh, from SpaceX fame, uh, Tesla has acquired Twitter. That's been a deal running in the background. He's gone in there pretty quickly. He's paid a few bucks for it, uh, and he's and he's gone out and sacked uh, all the executives, and he's getting his red pen out, and he's pushing it right through that organization. We see Mark Zuckerberg from uh, Facebook fame. Uh, they've been hammered in the share, share market, and again, he's got his red pen out, and he's just canning stuff all over the place. I think we're starting to see some sense to – changing ec economic conditions. This may be packaged up in tech valuations uh, uh, are going south uh, quickly. Tom, what's happening in real estate? Uh, uh, you know, there's got to be hurt in the market because sales are down, listings are down, sales are down. Um, uh, agency principals tightening their belts. <clears throat> yeah, so, there's, you know, there's there's two types of staff fuel in, uh, in real estate. You know, there's sales producers, and then there is fixed people on salaries. Uh, sales producers won't get sacked. They leave. You know, they're commission-based people, um, apart from a few that might be on, on a salary for a period of time till they get up and running, and many principals are no longer tolerating that. Um, they're basically saying, hey, you've got three months. I can't keep paying you a base salary. You might have to actually look at moving on commission only. Um, people on fixed salaries, sales assistants, I'm worried about them. I'm worried about them because they're normally employed on a base salary to help an agent, you know, make, make sales and, and get listings. They're vulnerable. They're on salaries between 50 and $80,000 a year. Good ones are even on a hundred. They're vulnerable. Um, essentially, you know, some of the management staff that some businesses have, um, I mean, Phil, we got to understand, we've got people that have reduced their incomes between 20 and 40% in real estate. Um, and um, and we've seen, as you've said, we've seen, uh, so, fa so Twitter has sacked half its workforce. Um, at Facebook, one in eight people has been terminated by Zuckerberg. Um, and, you know, I'm, you know, like, Using Elon, using Elon Musk's philosophy, Elon Musk has come in and said, "This thing's a business. I'm not going to have. I'm not going to be paying base salaries on people sitting sitting on um, a cushion cushion chairs. You know, um, uh, talking about stuff that's not income producing. Uh, I'm introducing a model where you get a blue tick and you pay eight dollars a month of subscription, right?" Um, and I think the learnings that we're getting that in real estate is you better make sure that you're delivering value in your role because if you're not, you could be um, impacted. I, I, I was, I didn't like, I mean, I, I saw on TikTok a lot of staff <coughs> from Twitter who indicate the way they were sacked was they just had an email sent to them, you know, um, which, I mean, I know that you just wouldn't do that in your organisation. There'd be something before before the formal email, um, but Phil, man, we're in, we're in. I don't know whether I'm able to show you this, but I want to actually show our viewers a very important slide. Let me bring it up, if I can, because I haven't been using Streamyard to share slides for a while. But let's see if we can do it. Share screen. Okay, uh, cancel here. Present. This is technology in action. Look at the way we work these days. It's uh, yeah. I feel it's going to take me too. It's going to take me. It's going to take me. Uh, oh, maybe not. Maybe I can do it. It's going to take. Oh, sorry. It's going to take me a little bit too long to do it, and I don't want to affect the momentum of this um, stream. There's a, there's a graph that CoreLogic RP data has put out there that shows the last nine corrections in real estate. I'm familiar with that. Yep. You're familiar with it? 
Okay, so we can have a quick chat about it because it does impact the plans of our officers and it also impacts the narrative that real estate salespeople should be having with their vendors. And that is that, Phil, in the last 35 years, the average correction lasts for 20 months. And um, then it goes on. We had our first rate rise in March this year. We're nearly at the end of this calendar year. We're about halfway through that correction if we use data to indicate it. So what does that basically mean? If you're a vendor right now and you're thinking of selling, you're better off selling now than in six months' time. If you're a vendor that does not have to sell, is not that really motivated, has no real strong motivation to really leave, you probably got to see our 2023, right? You're not going to come back in February and the market's going to be booming, right? I mean, do you have a view, Phil, that there's going to be a rate increase in December? Yeah, I do. I reckon they may go 25 basis points. And you've spoken about this, Tom. Um, the, the rhetoric coming out of the Reserve Bank of Australia is, is just too strong. Um, when most recent numbers come out around inflation, et cetera, um, they're talking about inverted commas by memory slaying the dragon, the dragon being inflation. Um, you know, we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. This 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 challenge they have, this um, this dichotomy of um, championing spending in retail sales over the Christmas period, which a lot of Australian, particularly SME businesses, rely upon, and not curtailing spending too much. However, um, keeping in check what they're trying to achieve through rising rates and that is to slow down spending um so it's it's a really really interesting i reckon 25 basis points um in in december is where i'm sitting Feb at the moment. Feb 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 february uh well well obviously in january they don't meet so it doesn't happen i think february there's probably a good chance they'll wait and see what the the real impact is from that summer season when aussies are on holidays and and doing all that christmas stuff um a lot of people I'm chatting to is that we're, we're nearing the top of the cycle and there's got to be some more. Some of the banks are, I think are predicting about sort of 3.25%. Um, two of the other majors, I can't remember who they were sort of topping out at 3.8%. So there's, there's, there's somewhere between 25 basis points and a hundred basis points still to go in this interest rate cycle, Tom. Um, so I, 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 the RBA is conscious that they don't want to go too hard. Um, you know, finding out where that ceiling is going to be really tough because um, I'll tell you what, the banks will happily pass on interest rate um, hikes to the consumer immediately. Uh, if the RBA goes too hard and too high, uh, I can't see the banks sort of going out of their way if the RBA starts cutting uh, to drop their rates in line with that. They're going to be slow. They're going to be fast on the way up and slow on the way down. So, if the RBA goes too high, it might lock in interest rates at a, at, a, uh, at, a, at an amount which is too damaging for the economy and is negative to the effect they're trying to get, and the banks won't be quick to try and remedy that. So that, that's my concern at the moment. Um, 25 basis points either way of that, I think you're okay, but if they push it too much, I think we're concerned. So no for, no for February, I'm going to say, Tom. No for February. Okay. I just... Listen, I've criticised the Reserve Bank once. I'm not going to do it again. But I, I just feel that when language that's used is we have to slay the dragon, the only one tool we have is interest rates. We're going to get... Um, sorry, the, we're going to get inflation from 8% to 3%. Why does it have to be 3 Why do you have to... You know, why do you have to keep, you, you know, you know, last time we heard him say rates aren't going up to 2024. I think I think it's better to actually be a little bit more vague than actually because I, I example, I've got a friend who's a buyer who said to me, I'm not buying. I said, why is that? He goes, well, if you want to get rate in, inflation down from 8% to 3%, and he said, that's what the Reserve Bank has said. They want to get it down and they keep saying the only tool that they have is interest rates. He said, 
I just see interest rates keep going up and up and up. So, does Phil, does that mean that they're going to keep increasing the interest rates till we see a 3% inflation number? That's what you'd be led to believe if you look at it at a basic level, Tom. You know, if, if that's no. the only... You've got to remember also... Um, uh, Inflationary pressures, a lot of the inflationary pressures, Tom, is, is outside of the control of the Australian government and the bureaucratic engine that supports it. There is still a lot of supply chain constraints, fuels expensive, agricultural products are expensive, consumer rules are expensive, COVID, um, China's still chasing a zero COVID policy. We still have the war in Europe. We have all these things which are impacted pricing, right? We can't do a lot about that sort of stuff. You know, so so these two things will happen in in, in lockstep. The the RBA will continue to increase rates. I, I I like to think appropriately with an eye towards inflationary pressures easing through the osmosis of what's going on in the macro global economic environment. So that's why I think they're going to be they're going to be careful to go too hard next year because you should see the softening and that that natural softening that happens. Look, is the war in Europe going to? continue for, um, uh, indefinitely. I think only today uh, Russia's formally annexing territory and making it part of Russia, that, that's still got some way to play out, right? This ain't, this ain't, this ain't going to go away quickly. Um, and do yourself a favour, go and have a look how big Ukraine is and, and Google its economy and its contribution to the European economy, how that flows in. It's a pretty important place. It's the, it's, it's the rice bowl of, um, of Europe in many ways. So we're going to have these presses around. For a long time, Tom, and we can't do much about that. Australian government can't do much about it. So who knows? I just urge caution. Don't go too hard, RBA, um, because uh, you don't want to be putting Australians in a position, the third of Australians who have a mortgage, where uh, you just you just fundamentally fracture the economy to the degree where we start going backwards. They're, they're, they're showing or um, uh, forecasting very sort of low GDP growth Um next year is pretty lackluster um looking better in 2024 but anyway getting outside the realm of this we probably need to get an economist on tom someone that knows what they're talking about rather than two blokes that knock around property and just yeah. consume information yeah so so phil i actually might reach out for next week and try and get uh um multiple economy um, you know may, maybe get louis christopher on and tim lawless because yep. it'll be good to have have the banter on i've <clears throat> I'll reach out to both of them. I'm sure that uh, uh, they'll try yeah, let's, and make let's them do a panel. They're, they're, they're both they're both good operators. They'll they'll look at it through the lens of uh, real estate. Um, but you know what, real estate is is a key driver of economic activity in Australia. So mate, let's get let's get them on. Let's do a bit of a panel meeting of minds. hundred percent. Now, Phil, before we finish off, so I'll reach I'll I'll reach out to them, Phil. And we'll try and, and have them on for next week, if not the week after. We'll try next week. Um, the last thing we can probably touch on is uh, we're in, you know, we're the beginning of, uh, well, sorry, we're on the 10th of November. You know, I, I, I know that within the next two weeks, there's going to be people taking Ubers into the city and Christmas parties begin. Normally happens around the 20th, 25th of November. And then I actually, I'm predicting a very big Christmas party celebrations this year, Phil. Everything we've seen post, uh, post-COVID post has been big, whether it's Melbourne Cup stuff, right? You know, people are out in, in, in full force. And I think it's really important, um, Phil, that I was brought up, and I think Manny, uh, Manus Vindicarcus once said, there's a term, it's called ONFM, October, November, February, March. It is such an important part of the lives of the real estate agents and the mortgage brokers of Australia. This is where deals are being done and set up. This is not the time of the year where you go on Christmas holidays, mentally or physically, um, in the middle of November, Phil. You know, uh, Bob Mansfield, I think it was, was he ex-Optus or Telstra? Optus, I think, wasn't he? CEO. He was once on a business channel and he said, he said, here's the problem. If you have a very bad October, November, December quarter, you're chasing yourself for the rest of the year. You're on the back foot. So much better to go to Christmas, 
having your car parked on the top of the hill, come back, release the handbrake, and you're off and flying. So how do you do that? You set yourself up for success now. You set yourself up for success now, you know. I've made, um, you know, I've said it last week, Phil, I made the decision to not join my family going overseas to Italy. Two reasons. One, I think I, I should not be, get on too many flights at the moment and give myself a chance to uh, get over sinusitis. Uh, number two is that I just know the next four or five weeks I'm going to have all my work locked in away for January to around Easter, right? If I just disappear now, Phil, I'm going to come back. Chances are I would have put on three kilos. The belt's going to be tied around the stomach. I'm going to come back, going to feel like I need another holiday after the holiday, I'm going to be stressing, saying, you know, where do I start? What What's the work I've got to do? So, you know, to all our listeners, our viewers, you'll have a much better break if you actually finish this year strong. You know, feel a lot better. Yeah, you'll lease a lot of the worry over the Christmas period. You actually relax and recharge rather than lament and and um, uh, and, and worry. So anyway, we'll um, we're going to work out whether or not we're going to do a shutdown over Christmas, Tom, um, on Real Estate Exposed. We'll, we'll record all the way up. Uh, o N D F M. Maybe we give January a skip, but. Um, yeah, Lisa Novak's always got it right. Any other comments, Tom, before yeah. we round out? Yeah, I've got to say, I've got to, you know, look at this. Look at this. Let's look at Lisa Novak. You know, I was with her the other day. Cracked a manly record for 21. So she sold this last week. 21.5 million for a 400 metre square knockdown house, eight bidders. No guide throughout the campaign, just comparable and honest conversations to 380 buyers. A guide would have pissed off buyers in the end, right? So incredible result. It's funny, isn't it? We still keep seeing actually the block's been the block is a great indicator of what's happening out there in the world. You got all these other properties not selling, yet one goes for incredible money. John McGrath pulled out his uh, auction hammer on Saturday and went out and auctioned a property himself in Hunter's he Hill. He sold it for twenty million for Tracy Dixon in. Um, in, in Hunter's Hills, right? And Lisa, so Lisa still sold it at a higher price. She uh, she reminded us on the day that we were sitting with John on, on Tuesday. Um, and this is, I was on Switzer this morning and he was talking about the market because he said to me that, that he said, Tom, that what's being reported is only drops under 10%. Um, and I said, it's very simple. When you've got the high end that's going gangbusters, that actually dilutes some of the softening of the lower end. I yeah, said right. the lower end, yeah, the lower end feel is more like 10 to 15%, right? But, you know, Lisa and, and John McGrath sell these houses for incredible money because we clearly know, Phil, that high end, the money's still there, man. The money's there. Yep, good for sure people is. like you, Phil. Good, good for people like you that run big companies with lots of staff, lots of revenue streams coming in. That's your market, Phil. Mate, I'm just about to go and have my lunch of Maggi noodles and a can of baked beans, mate. It's not that flush, I'll tell you that. Great. Let's finish on this. I saw a great TikTok video. A gentleman said, I can't help it. He was he was he was of he, he was uh, he was of he was of Lebanese descent. His name's Monkey Monkey Magic. He says I can't help it. I've just left Canterbury Bankstown, and all I'm seeing is the C CF sixty threes Gucci bags. Everyone's looking great, and he goes, I'm just doing a bit of work here, out in Double Bay. He goes, and I'm off in Vaucluse. And he goes, everyone's wearing plain clothes there. And he goes, and you're not seeing as many, many, many flash cars. He says, read into it what you like. Uh, read into what you like. And um, I, think, I, think, I think the real story there is it's uh, what you're left with. It's not what you make that really actually um, matters. And we know that in, uh, in, 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 in you know, we know in, in property, I see it all the time, Phil. I see people. Uh, forget the Lamborghini guy. Let's talk about and forget about Danny. 
from the block. Let's talk about every weekend. I see people that uh, they're not tech entrepreneurs. Um, they're not necessarily senior executives. Uh, they're just people that are very good with managing money and they put money into real estate and they know that some years they get 15%, some years they get 5%, some years they go down, but they just know at the end of the 10 years they've made a lot of money while they've slept. And that's why you and I, you and I are obsessed with property, Phil. We know that it can change the trajectory of your life and your family's life. You know? Yep, people have been doing it for years, Tom, so... You're either helping people out with it or you're doing it yourself. And I like to think most mortgage brokers and real estate agents should be investing in the asset class that they work within. That's smart business. Tom was spoken about it cool. before, but yes. One more, one more question. I got asked this mm. yesterday on a podcast by someone. He said, Tom, why don't more real estate people build their own real estate portfolios? And I said, oh, but some do. He goes, yeah, but most don't. Why is that? What's your answer to that, Phil? I, I, I reckon if you were going to, and I'm going to probably answer this academically, um, I, I reckon if you survey the real estate agent population, you would find that those people who have been in real estate longer will have property portfolios because uh, I think they'll go through a motion in the cycle of the glitz and glamour of real estate early on and buying the fancy cars and wearing the right watches and, and all that sort of stuff. And there'll be an inflection point, which will typically be marriage and family when they probably start thinking about their money differently. So um, I think the real estate agent population is younger than older. I think you have a lot more entrants and it's hard to, to stick at it for some time. Only the best agents stay the, the course of time, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Those smart operators who are less about the glitz and glamour and they're more about wealth creation. So I think it's because it's a young industry, Tom. It's probably my answer. Yeah. I, you know, I think you're probably right. I think you're probably right. And of course, the challenge with that, Phil, is that, and you know it, because we're both uh, family men, the older you get, with families, your opportunity to grow wealth is still there, mm. but you'd be crazy not to take advantage of it and use the compounding effect of real estate because we know it's time in the market, not timing the market, right? Um, and I just think it's a really good lesson for young people to understand that um, – You've got this opportunity in your younger years when you don't have private university school fees, where you don't have all the costs involved with family to intelligently divert money into property and also have the stomach for debt. I think a lot of people don't have a stomach for debt. They've got this fear of debt, right? Mm. And quite rightly, but debt on investment is quite different to debt on principal place of residence. Yep, I completely agree, Tom, and we can do a whole podcast around educating people appropriately on money. It's um, it's crazy. Lisa, again, practice what we preach. I think a lot is blown on fast cars. Sure is. Um, secret of real estate, start as early as you can. And, you know, and also around sort of family and stuff, Tom, when you're, when you're, when you're single and have less responsibilities, when you can be a lot more selfish about your time and how you dedicate and invest that time towards income producing activities. Um, it's when you can set yourself up before life gets more, uh, not complicated, but, but, but um, more involved. So get stuck in when you can real estate agents. Um, Tom Panos. Thanks again. That's quite a long real estate expose running off the black of the, Back of the uh, the block, how long that will continue? I reckon you've probably got a few more days in the news cycle be before you've forgotten about Tom. So make hay while the sun shines. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that. I've seen that. I've seen that on Big Brother. One minute they're famous, the next minute they're just another guy walking down the street. Yeah. Well, I'm sure everyone's stopping you right now to want to have a yarn, Tom. But thanks for your time today. That's real estate exposed across Tom Panos. Facebook network and real estate business on Phil Tarrant. That's Tom Panos. We'll see you again next week. Until then, bye-bye.